That's just the way it was. So let me start off this morning. We're going to be in Proverbs chapter 7 this morning, but I, I want to get started this morning just giving you a couple practical things, the three things we should know about people who are directionally challenged. How many of you are directionally challenged? <laughs> and proud of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, here's the first one. They don't get lost on purpose. In fact, my dad, he thought more about where he needed to go and the directions than people who knew where they were going and got there. I mean, he, he gave a lot of thought. So they don't get lost on purpose. In fact, just the opposite is true. I remember um, after we got him the GPS and he and mom were up here, it was either that visit or the next visit, and they said they wanted to go see Scott and Amy, our daughter and, and son-in-law. And so they live in Mason. So we thought, okay, I'm not going to take my dad and mom up to Scott and Amy's house. I'm going to get them there with this GPS. So I got the GPS. I put their address in, plugged it in. Dad had a smartphone, uh, although I don't think his is as smart as some people's. And uh, so we set that with the GPS too. And we put, so he had two GPS devices. Plus I explained to him, dad, you go up to Kip Road and you get off and you take the left at the light, da, 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 all of that. So I, I felt pretty good about this. I thought, I think this is going to work. Well, about 45 minutes later, it would only take about 15 minutes to get there. Uh, I get a phone call from my dad. And uh, I said, what's up, Dad? Did you get there? Uh, no, we didn't get there. I said, okay, uh, where are you? He said, um, I don't know. Uh, I said, okay, I do, are you in the city or are you in the country? Well, we're out in the country somewhere. I said, okay, um, what intersection are you near? I don't know. So I said, <clears throat> My dad had all of his faculties ab about him, just as much as he ever did, but he just didn't know how, he, directions were not his thing. So it ended up, I said, okay, dad, here's what I want you to do. You drive to the nearest intersection and tell me if you see road signs that tell you what the streets are. He said, okay, I'll call you back. So a little bit, a few minutes later, he got back on the phone, called me, and, and I said, okay, dad, where are you? He said, well, we're at the corner of Columbia and I don't remember the second street. And he told me, and I said, okay, are you on the east side of Mason? Or are you on the west side of, M I don't know. So I called 911, okay? I thought this will be the way to do it. So I called 911. I said, listen, my, this is not an emergency, but my dad and mom are lost, and they don't know where they are. And they're at the corner of Columbia and whatever that other street was. Can you tell me where that is? And they said, yes, that's, I think they said to the east of Mason. And so I, I got back on the phone, called my dad. I said, dad, wait right there. Because, I mean, directions and computers are two things. There's no concept, you know, about what to do. So I said, wait right there. I'm going to come get you. He said, okay. So I drove out there. I said, now follow me. And I drove, I ended up driving to Scott and Amy's house anyway and uh, got them there. But, but. He is directionally challenged, but he doesn't get lost on purpose. In the same way, nobody ever started out in life trying to think of what path they wanted to be on and thought, you know, I think I want to be a drug addict for my life. I, I, I think I'd like to do a long stint in prison. Or, you know what, I'd like to be bankrupt by the time I'm 25. But people step onto those paths all the time, and they end up at those destinations, and then they gripe and complain about the fact, well, why did God let this happen to me? When the truth be told, they stepped onto a path that led them to that destination. The fact is, they don't get lost on purpose. Second thing is, they never know when they get on the wrong path. Just all of a sudden, they'll be driving along. I can imagine my dad at the airport in Nashville and thinking, I don't remember this when I was going up to Dyke's house before. And he would all of a sudden think, maybe I'm lost. But they don't remember when they got on. And, and then it, it created another problem because um, when dad would be driving and uh, the, the Garmin would say recalculating, he would put his brakes on no matter where he was, Okay. And, and, and people behind him would be, you know, because he, and all of his attention would go to that GPS and he was trying to figure out, 
um, what was going on there. There's a third thing about people who are directionally challenged, and um, that is this. The road they travel always determines where they end up. And in life, the road you travel with your kids, with your marriage, with your job, with your finances, with your health, that the road that you travel always trumps your intentions. It always trumps your intentions. It doesn't matter what your intentions are relating to your finances. If you don't choose a path that's going to lead you there, you're not going to get where you want to go because you always get, you're going to get where you're going. Now, one thing that I've discovered in my own life and listening to the stories of others is we choose paths that don't lead us in the direction that we want to go. And we may choose that path because for some reason that path is appealing. I would like to drive a newer car. I would like to uh, date that guy or that girl. I, I, would like, I would like to have good good health. But we choose paths that don't lead us to those destinations. And every path has a predictable destination. Jesus said that the, uh, the road to hell is like that. He said it's a wide road and many people end up on it. Another challenge is we rely heavily on our intentions and don't pay attention uh, enough attention to our direction. It doesn't really matter where you meant to end up in life. It really doesn't. The road that you choose to travel is going to determine that. It doesn't matter if you, if you wanted to be clean and sober if you're traveling a road that isn't going to lead you there. It doesn't matter if you didn't want to be a burden to your kids if you're not taking the steps necessary to be sure that you're not. Because we can't rely on our intentions. We have to pay enough attention to our direction. And then the third thing is we miss the connection between the choices we make and the outcomes we experience. Um, every one of us here have been surprised at times with some of the outcomes that we've experienced in life. Another word for outcome would be consequences for the choices that we've made. Um, <clears throat> today we're going to be in the seventh chapter of Proverbs. Proverbs was written by King Solomon, and he was the wisest man to ever live. Uh, he asked, the Lord asked him, he said, I'm going to give you one thing that you can have. Whatever it is you want, I'll give it to you. And he said, wisdom. And he said, because you didn't ask me for riches, I'm going to throw that in too. And so he was a very wealthy man. He was the king, and he was also the wisest man on record. And he records something that he saw one night as he was winding down from his day, and he saw it from the palace window. Now, whether this is something that it actually happened or whether this is allegorical from the standpoint of he's talking about humankind in general, I don't know. I have a tendency to believe it had to do with... Um, uh, the reality of it, this actually did happen. But anyway, in Proverbs chapter 7, verse 6, he starts like this. At the window of my house, I looked out through the lattice. <clears throat> I saw among the simple, that is the foolish, uh, someone lacking in wisdom, I noticed among the young men a youth who lacked judgment. Now, picture this. He's looking out through the window of his house, and he sees a young man, and he knows somehow that this young man is lacking in judgment. It had to be from something that he saw him do, because that's not something that you can tell what somebody's thinking. You have to look at their actions. And he says, he said that this was a young man old enough to have gone through puberty, yet young enough to be lacking in wisdom. He says in verse 8, Passing along the street near her corner, this was known as her corner, taking the road to her house, in the twilight, that is about dusk, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. Now, you don't have to be very smart to know where this is going to lead. 
there's something untoward about this. It's kind of like if you're watching America's Funniest Videos and the dad is standing two feet in front of his son with a baseball and he, he, he goes like this and the son's standing there. The dad's two feet away. The son has a four foot bat. What do you think's going to happen? Okay, that dad's going to catch it with the bat. And, and that's what is going to happen here because he says he sees him. He was alone at night in a part of town that had a reputation. He knew exactly where he was. He was near her corner. What's about to happen is not an isolated event. This is a young man who has just stepped onto a path, and that path was going to lead him to a predictable destination. He knew who this woman was because she had a reputation. And he was in a part of town because he was looking for what he was about to find. And that's why he was there. And he thought that it would be exciting. He thought that it would be the most wonderful thing he'd ever experienced. And so he found himself there because that's where he went. This night, however, was a step onto a path, a path that, like all other paths, has a predictable destination. What was obvious to Solomon escaped this young man completely. And what Solomon saw was very different than what this young man saw because he didn't have sound judgment. Strange how many times those around us can see with greater clarity what's going on in our life and the warning signals that we need to be paying attention to in our life than we can. The story continues. Verse 10, and behold, the woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. She is loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market, and at every corner, she lies in wait. This woman was trouble, and Solomon, as he watched out of his window and saw this unfolding, and nobody knew he was watching, he could tell that this was trouble in the making. Verse 13, she seizes him and kisses him, and with bold face she says to him, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I have paid my vows. Think about the strangeness of this. Here's this woman who's up to no good, she's out here to seduce somebody, and she brings her religion into it. I was thinking, how many times does God get dragged into stuff? I mean, I've actually, I've actually had uh, people that would have said to me, you know, that they're, they're cohabitating before they get married, and uh, they've said to me, yeah, we, we prayed and we just had a sense of peace from God. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Uh, and we're going to talk next week about how we need to be honest. God would never put his stamp of approval on that. And that doesn't mean you're a dirt bag and, and not worth anything, and that's the worst sin you could ever commit. But, but be honest with him and be honest with yourself that that, that isn't what's, what's going on. Uh, it, God is okay with me driving this. I knew a guy one time that, that bought a car, and the car payment was more than his mortgage and I'm sure he thought that was a good path to step onto at some point or another, okay? And, uh, but it wasn't. Um, God, uh, God wants me to do this because God wants me to be happy, right? Well, not first and foremost. First and foremost, God wants you to be godly, and he wants your character to be what it needs to be. And then after that, he does want you to experience joy in the midst of all that, which you can. This guy can't believe his ears. Here's a woman that's religious. She's talking about the fact that she went and offered her sacrifices the day before. And she's standing out there looking good on the street corner. And she wants to hook up with him that night. Verse 16, she said, I have spread my couch with coverings. Covered linens from Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. For my husband, are you kidding me? She brought God into it. Now she's bringing her husband into it. And it doesn't bother her. She says, my husband is not at home. 
He's gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him, and at full moon, he will come again. So she informs him that she has everything ready, and he doesn't have to worry about her husband barging in on them because uh, he's out on business and, and everything's going to be fine. This young man thought, this is the best day of my life. I've come down here. Whether he had been down there or before, I think he probably had because it says that he was down near her corner and he wouldn't know that if he hadn't been there before. But he comes down there and in verse 21, it says, with persuasive words, she led him astray. That is, she spoke to him in such a way that it took him to a place where he shouldn't be going in his mind and in his intellect. She seduced him with her smooth talk. All at once, he followed her. And I'm sure this, this young man thought he hit the jackpot. And look what Solomon said, like an ox going to the slaughter. It's like the, the ox or the cow, they're bringing it in to the slaughterhouse and they put it in that booth and uh, where it's real tight on both sides. They give it something to eat and then boom, it's dead. Just like that. No warning. All of a sudden, it says like a deer stepping into a noose. That is a trap, a snare on the ground. And the deer comes along and steps and it's snared by the trap. Verse 22, as a stag caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver. This guy was going to be a captive and then dead before too long. It'd be like shooting fish in a barrel, if you know what I mean. That's, that's, how, uh, that's how perilous his situation was. And he thought it was a good place to be. In fact... He had come there intentionally looking for something. He was like a bird that uh, rushes into a snare. He does not know that it will cost him his life. He looks in the little box that's propped up with a stick, and he looks underneath that box, and he sees a pile of bird seed. Are you kidding me? A pile of bird seed, and I've been flying around here for days looking for what? And he runs to the bird seed. The box comes down, and instead of eating dinner, he becomes somebody's dinner. And then Solomon begins to talk to those who are reading this, and he says this, and now, O oh sons, listen to me. Listen to me. And be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her, what? Paths. This wasn't a one-time event. This was a path. And this young man followed that path, and it took him to where he was wanting to go, but it was going to cost him everything. It's like what I said last week. It was not, not, I wasn't the first one to say it, that sin will always take you further than you intended to stray. It will cost you more than you intended to pay. It will. That's the nature of sin. And even though he looked at this as a very positive situation because he found what he was looking for, Solomon said the thing that he's found is going to cost him dearly. Proverbs 7, verse 26 says, For many a victim has she laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. That is, the path that he was walking was a well-worn path to destruction that many had walked before him. And Solomon sums it up with these final words. Her house is the way to Sheol, the grave. Um, that is... Uh, the word way is highway, and it's, it's like the road to hell is wide and many people follow it. But this path is literally a dead-end street. At that moment, though, the path seemed to be the most appealing thing he was looking at. And that's the thing. The journey, the path, it might look appealing and it may be something that we might think, you know, I don't want anything as much as I want this. 
but it's a dead end street. And the man that was out there didn't even realize it. We all have the propensity. JP said it a moment ago, having a mess, making a mess of our life. We all do stupid stuff. Every one of us. But God wants us to get on a path that's going to lead us to a good destination. And let me just say this. It always costs more than you intended to pay. I mentioned last week about a a young man that grew up here at Rives that ended up uh, getting murdered down in Jackson. He didn't deserve that. He, He did not deserve that. That was far and away costing him more than he intended to pay. It was not fair. It was not just. But that's the nature of following the wrong path. It leads us to places that cost us more than we intended to pay because we've stayed there too long. It's like the person who says they have a high standard for who they will marry, but they'll date anybody if she's beautiful or if he's cute and they forget about the character. Or the person who says they want a deep relationship with God, but they spend more time online or viewing pornography than they do in the Word of God. Or the young couple who say they want to be financially secure, but they never make the decisions to change the path that they're on. And if they stay on that particular path, it will not have a different destination than it always has. Because that's the nature of paths. Or the student who wants to get good grades and has wonderful intentions for making the dean's list, but they don't study. That's a path. Or the parents who say they want their kids to develop a relationship with Jesus Christ, but they never make it an important enough thing to make sure they bring them to church. Everything, it's been my um, experience that, There are many professing believers who will come to church if they don't have anything else going. And it's never a priority that they plan their life around. Or the wife who says she wants a close relationship with her husband, but she makes their kids her first priority. That's a path. And it ends at a predictable destination. Okay, here's a deep theological truth. Okay, this is going to blow you away this morning. If you want to lose weight, you don't eat at Dunkin' Donuts. That's pretty, that's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. I love Dunkin' Donuts. But if you, if you want to lose weight, you don't eat at Dunkin' Donuts. Okay, in the same way, if you want to have a relationship with God, you've got to get into his word and you've got to surrender your will to him. If you want his blessing in your life, you have to choose a path that is going to end up at the destination where you are going to receive that blessing because you took that path. If you want to have a good marriage, there's a path to take for that. And it can't be that you live your life for yourself. And hope your your husband or wife will get with the program and love you anyway. Which they should, but you ought to be doing your part too. We arrive at destinations and we often ask ourselves, why would God let this happen to me? God didn't let that happen to us. We chose a path. And that path had a predictable destination. And everybody around us that loves us could see that. And for some reason, either we couldn't see it or we enjoyed the journey so much that we forgot about the destination. I'm saying this because I love you this morning and I want you to hear the truth from God's word. You and I, every day of our life, are choosing paths. And when we choose the path, we also choose the destination. You're going to get where you're going. 10 or 12 years ago, I was standing right here. And it was on a Sunday about this time. And all of a sudden, I started hearing all kinds of sirens. And I thought, I wonder what's going on. But I didn't think about it for long because I didn't want to lose my train of thought. And I finished up the message and I went home. I found out that a young man and his brother 
from Northwest High School had gone out. Uh, I don't know where they were going, but they were in the car. And the older brother was driving, and the younger brother was only like 12 years old at the time. And uh, they went down Dixon Road, and they came to a bend in the road, and they ended up going into the river with the car. And the, the car turned upside down in the river. And when it was upside down in the river, the little brother was able to escape. The older brother, they think, was probably knocked out. And he drowned there in the river. When they left the house that morning, I can tell you, even though I didn't know them, they were not thinking the route that we choose is going to determine whether we stay or alive or we die today. But that's exactly what, was, what it was. If they would have chosen another route to go that day and been going a little too fast, they might have ended up in a farmer's field. But instead, the older brother ended up dying, and his funeral was here at the church. There was literally a 1,000 people at that funeral here at this church. They were sitting all over the place. We had closed circuit over here, people back here, chairs. We set up every chair that we had. That's how we knew how many people we had. And there were people standing along the wall. At the time, we had a choir loft, and the people were uh, seating, sitting in the choir loft. But when he left the house that morning, the path that he chose determined what was going to happen to him that day. That was not his intention. It was not his intention. He didn't think, ah, I'm going to take uh, Dixon Road and today's going to be the day I die. No, his intention was wherever he was going. Maybe he was going over to a friend's house. Maybe they're going to meet somebody for lunch. Maybe he was running to the store. You don't know. But the path that he chose had a destination that was devastating. Taking the wrong path can cost you your freedom. A marriage, years of your life, your health, a job. Taking the wrong path can be costly from a financial standpoint. This principle is always operating in the back of your life. You don't have to think, I need to choose a path. No, every day of your life, you're choosing a path. And, it, and that path that you choose, whether it's conscious, whether it's unconscious, is going to take you to a destination. You're on a current relational path. Let me ask you a question. As it relates to your relationship, say your marriage if you're married, if all things being equal and you continue on that path, what kind of a destination are you going to arrive at? You're on a moral and ethical path. Maybe you've been stealing stuff from work. And nobody, nobody knows about it but you. If you stay on that path, you won't arrive at the destination for that path right away. But there will be a day when you arrive at that path and things come to light and you get in trouble and you lose your job or you go to jail or whatever if you stay on that path. What kind of a financial path are you on? Where are you going to be financially in 10 years if nothing changes? Are you still going to be spending every paycheck before you get it? Or are you going to take the steps necessary to bring your finances under the leadership of God's spirit and let, let him show you about budgets and all this stuff and about saving and about investing and about giving and paying your bills on time? If nothing changes, everything stays the same, okay? So things need to change as far as the path in our life. There's a verse here in um, Proverbs 27, verse 12, that I want to finish up with. It says this, the prudent see danger and take refuge, okay? Let me give you an example. The prudent see the sign or see that the bridge is out on this road, and they find another route. Kind of what we're having to do now with all this work taking place down at 127 and 94. Okay? The prudent, the prudent being the wise person sees that and they prepare themselves or they take refuge. This verse tells us that there are two kinds of people. There's the prudent and then it says the simple keep going and suffer for it. 
Okay? So they're prudent and simple, the wise and the foolish. They both see danger coming, but they respond very differently. Oh, the bridge is out? I'm going to put my foot down. I'm going to get going a little quicker. I want to get there quicker. The prudent, the wise person says, the bridge is out. I've got to take a different path than this. Then there's the foolish or the naive person, and it says that they keep going and suffer for it. The foolish person is playing golf, and the thunderstorm comes, and they continue playing golf. Because the majority of people that play golf when there's lightning are fine. The naive person sees no connection between their choices today and their future consequences. Every time we buy that thing that we feel that we can't live without, we sacrifice our financial future on the altar of the immediate. I want it now. And I'm going to have it now because I can, quote, afford the payment. It's not what these two groups of people see that's different. They both see that the bridge is out. It's not that at all. It's how they respond that's different. The wise person does something about it. They find a new circle of friends. They stop living on junk food. They start eating dinner together as a family. They change their phone number. They cut up their credit cards. They get help with a budget. They go for counseling rather than, than feeling like they've got it all and, and, and they have all the answers. They pour all the alcohol down the sink. They start setting the alarm on Sunday mornings. They prioritize being a part of the church, and then they work their whole schedule around that. They have that difficult conversation rather than always putting it off till tomorrow. They get an accountability partner. They break up. They move out. They do the hard work that will change their direction and determine their final destination. The naive, however, keep going and suffer for it. They keep moving forward. Let me just say this. You and I are not going to be the exception when it comes to the path that we choose. You're not. And it's going to take you further than you intended to stray It'll keep you longer than you intended to stay, and it'll cost you more than you intended to pay. And we're telling you that and saying that and looking at this passage from God's Word today in order that you can know that today and get on a different path. Because the path that you choose is going to determine the direction and the quality of your life. Let me conclude with a couple questions this morning for us to consider. Are there any consistencies, inconsistencies between where you want to be and the path you are traveling? Because every path has a predictable destination. Uh, are you traveling one path and hoping for a different destination? Are you, are you traveling to Detroit and hoping that against all hope that you'll end up in Chicago. If you travel, you're going to get where you're going. Here's the second one. Is there agreement between your intentions and your directions? You know, intentions are worth this if you don't act on them. They're worthless. Have you ever heard somebody say about noble intentions? She's got such noble intentions. Attentions are nothing if you don't follow through on them. I mean, how many, how many people who are addicted have had a, intentions every day of their life for years that they're going to get free of it? How far does that, do the intentions get them? They don't get them anywhere. 
It's the direction that you're traveling that's going to determine where you end up. And let me just say this, the path is often more enjoyable than the destination when it comes to some of these paths that we want to, invo- want to avoid. Are you wise or are you simple? I, I've often said that people come in two groups, those who learn from the mistakes others make and those who are determined that they have to make every mistake for themselves in order to learn. And God's gracious, and sometimes there's another opportunity to come back and do it God's way, but sometimes there's not. And so we're giving a message today uh, that, uh, that has to do with, uh, you should have seen that coming. And yet all of us can become so enamored with the path that we don't see it coming. Let's pray. Lord.